Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the screening of Jurek. It's a beautiful film. Uh, but before we begin the show, I would like to say that uh, we, the civilized people of this world, uh, want to express and show our solidarity with the state of Palestine and with the Palestinian people. And we condemn the terrorist Israeli state for committing war crimes and atrocities in the in, in Gaza and, and you know, on its people. I met Powell in 2016 in uh, South Korea because uh, as an adventure travel filmmaker, as, a, as, a, as, as somebody who organizes a mountain film festival in Pakistan, uh, I was there and uh, Powell was there and Messner was there. And uh, so it was a great time in uh, Ulju Mountain Film Festival. Um, at the time, they, they, they screened Yurik at the Ulju International Mountain Festival, and Yurik got the Best Film Award. Um, we had a great time. We hung out. And you, uh, Pavel, welcome to Pakistan. This is, yeah, yeah. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> so later on, uh, we saw Yurik at Pakistan International Mount Film Festival, and we also gave them the, the first prize because the film is so good. It's about Jerzy Kakuchka, this legendary mountain climber, uh, who, if he was alive today, would have actually stolen, must have stolen the show from Messner because uh, Reinhold Messner was the first person to, to summit all 14, you know, 8,000 meter peaks. But Jerzy Kukushka was, I believe, ahead of him because he, he soloed many new ascents, and he actually uh, set the bar high for the, the coming generations. And I believe that, I hope Messner is not listening, but I think he was the best mountain climber of his time. And uh, he was unlucky that he was not able to uh, summit all 14 8,000 meter peaks uh, before Messner. So in 87, 1987, he was able to uh, uh, basically go to the top of all uh, 14 8,000 meter peaks. This film is, is, is a tribute to Jerzy Kukushka, and I think it's a beautiful film. That's why uh, the Ulju Mount Film Festival gave them the, the best film award, and we also did. So, Pavel, thank you for being here, and I think we can talk later about Jerzy Kukushka, his life. Uh, Nazir Sabar, the legendary Pakistani mountain climber, is here, and I'm sure... Uh, did you spend time with Jerzy? Uh, I met a couple of times. Yeah. So I'm sure, uh, you know, and he's big friends with Messner. By the way, a little story before we, we, we show the, the film. When I was in uh, South Korea, uh, Messner was there and everybody wanted to talk to Messner because he's like a superhero and like a big celebrity. And Messner is actually a very arrogant man. You know, he kind of shoots away people. He doesn't want to talk to a lot of people. But like everybody came and wanted to talk to Messner. And I was like, you know, if I go talk to him, he'll shoo me away. So I kind of like stood back. And when the people were done and he was trying not to talk to people, he's like, oh, you know, this, that, the other. And I went to him and I said, hi, I'm friends with Karnal Sher Khan and Nazir Sabar. And he actually went, whoa! And he pushed everyone away and then he talked to me for a very, very long time. Anyway, this is Yurik. Please enjoy the film and we'll take questions and answers after the film and we'll talk about it later on. This year, Yurik, Wanda. To się nałożyło też na zmiany społeczno-polityczne i tak razem doprowadziło do takiej nawet luki pokoleniowej. Zauważyłem, że zaczęli się ludzie spinać for fun, no, dla przyjemności, zrobić sobie zdjęcie w ładnych warunkach. Teraz nikt nie nosi biało-czerwony, teraz noszą telefon albo iPada. Dlaczego wybiera się znów na tak trudną górę jak losy na południową ścianę? A dlaczego kończy, skoro tak dobrze idzie?
<laughs> maybe we can invite Nazi. Yeah, of course, he was uh, the witness sorry, of yeah. the history. So uh, I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Nazi Saber and uh, the the. The, the ambassador of Polish Embassy to, to come and sit. Nazir Sabir. Yeah. I, I wasn't really told the format of the show, yeah. so, you know, I don't know. If you want to sit on the stage. Yeah, go ahead. Actually, I'm really curious about your opinion about the film. Maybe we can start from your, your opinion, not good or bad, but your, your f f thoughts about the film. Okay. Uh, Congratulations on this wonderful uh, part of your uh, documentary. I'm sure uh, it brought back many memories, mixed feelings, of course. Uh, the subject is so that mountaineering is always uh, asking for life and death situations and uh, some amazing uh, stories and a lot of tragedy. So it's full of uh, the mountaineering activity. Obviously, uh, I think uh, down the history of uh, m modern mountaineering, uh, Kukushka comes up as one of the outstanding shining stars of the Himalayan climbing uh, because not because he was the second, he deserved to be the first one, like Messner said. Uh, he did in a much better style all the 8,000 meter peaks in a much shorter time than Reinhold and many others who have done uh, after him. To, as a personal witness, <laughs> I would like to share a, a lighter story with you all. I met Kukuchka, with your permission I will tell this story. <coughs> I met Kukuchka for the first time up uh, on halfway up the broad peak. Reinhold Messner, uh, Colonel Sher Khan and myself, we were climbing together. Uh, we had no clue at that time any one of us, myself and Sher Khan, although we were part of the team, we had no clue that Masnar was aiming to do all the 8,000 meter peaks then. But he was very clever. He came a year ago, a year before we went in 1982 for Gashabrum 2 and uh, Broad Peak. He came uh, one year in advance to get permission for two peaks. Almost, almost 10 years later, I, I understood he was in competition. He, uh, in the film, he refuses that they were in competition, but later on, uh, I'm a witness to this competition. Without even knowing that he was aiming at all the uh, 14 thousand meter peaks, as we go up, uh, broad peak after we finished uh, Gashabrum 2, uh, we carried about 35 kilograms on our back because we didn't have enough porters to shift to uh, Broad Peak Base Camp. Uh, 11 hours, 35 kilograms, all three of us and two kitchen boys and cook. As we were planning to go up Broad Peak, uh, there was a news of tragedy on K2. There was one, the first Polish woman expedition on K2 going up the Abruzzi Ridge. Wanda Rutkevich, as you saw, was the leader of the expedition. And there was a huge 16-man team from Poland on the uh, northwest ridge of K2. Though those were the uh, glorious days of Himalayan climbing, and I think uh, golden age, I would call it. And there was an Austrian team on the Abruzzi itself. Reinhold Messner, myself, and Sher Khan were preparing to leave in the morning. A doctor of the ex ladies' expedition visited our base camp, so we were having lunch. When she got a call uh, with transceiver saying that Halina Kruger died in Camp 2, on K2. It was a big shock for everyone. 
And uh, Sher Khan and I wanted to volunteer to go and help them bring her down because they decided to bring the body down. Reinhold are good against this opinion. He said, no, weather is good. We are going to have a good spell of weather, so let's continue. After one hour of uh, arguments, Reinhold won. I and Sher Khan, having the Eastern feeling, after such a tragedy, we were not feeling well to go up. But unwantingly, we had no choice but to uh, accept and go. Early in the morning, we left, quite early. Uh, just two days before that, we met a German expedition. In those days, there, there would be only one or two expeditions on an 8,000 meter peak. This German expedition could not finish, so they went home, uh, but they gave us this good news of leaving a tent in Camp 2 with a lot of food. So we were pretty excited. And Sher Khan was responsible to carry food. I was carrying uh, cooking gas and a couple of other things. Uh, Reinhold was carrying climbing equipment, some rope and stuff. I was carrying the tent as well, two-man tent. So we left. I saw Sher Khan was like flying up the mountain. Bloody hell, like, <laughs> you know, 100 meters ahead of us all the time. What was going on? As far as we knew, there was nobody on the mountain. But around 6,200 meters, we saw two ghosts coming down. <laughs> Two figures, quite amazing. I don't know who the hell are they. As then we went nearer and nearer, we found out this was Kukuchka and Wojtek Kurtika. Of course, <laughs> <laughs> they, they believed in the freedom of mountains, so do I. But you know, because the uh, Nepalese started these permits and stuff and uh, followed by Pakistan in early 70s. Before that, there were no permits in Pakistan as well. But then the most strict country became China because of money. So I, I have absolutely no problem with the feeling of their philosophy of freedom of mountains and coming and climbing any mountain they would be able to. So they sneaked. Uh, they were on the women's expedition permit on K2. They were uh, trying the south face, which uh, he completed in 86. In 82, they were attempting. So anyway, as they came down, <clears throat> we greeted each other. This was my first uh, meeting with Kukuchka and with the Kurtika. As soon as they left, Probably they had gone uh, 50 meters or so, Reinhold uh, told Sher Khan. Sher Khan was also acting as our liaison officer because he was in the army then. Reinhold tells Sher Khan, Sher Khan, you make sure that these guys are blacklisted. <laughs> I didn't understand till much later, after many years, and we found that they were in competition. But anyway, we went up to find no tent and obviously no food, because the, the two Polish climbers they had consumed, <laughs> they took everything along, obviously anyone would do that. And it was good, nice of them that they were clinging the mountain, in other, in other words, but anyway, uh, Sher Khan had depended on that food, so he was not carrying any food. He was going empty, <laughs> flying up the mountain. We went and didn't find any tent and no food, so we went around uh, digging the tent site to put our own tent. We found some five years old food uh, packets, half eaten by ravens and crow. Uh, uh, vegetable packets, beans and peas and stuff. Sher Khan said, hey guys, I have cooked vegetable, I like you for you. <laughs> Thankfully, I didn't uh, consume 
much they both ate and I just uh, decided to be you know go for dinner with some biscuits it was a hard night obviously uh, it was one uh, two men tent and three of us were just uh, uh, fitting in in early morning I went out as I was the youngest because there was not enough space in, inside the tent to put on crampons outside the tent while I was putting on my crampons, I saw Sher Khan was throwing up from this end of the tent and Messner from the other end. Uh, they had obviously had uh, food poisoning. <laughs> Ravens had eaten five years old uh, food packets. But she, uh, all the way to the summit, I think Reinhold went on throwing up five, six times, even on the summit. I had a little tiny video camera and was trying to take video while he was throwing up and he literally kicked me off the mountain, he was so angry. Anyway, did the uh, broad peak and came down and uh, uh, we did this in three days up to the summit and all the way down next day to base camp and then went to the Polish base camp uh, for condolences. Uh, Kukuchka was... Uh, a extremely quiet soul. The, this was my observation, which I changed a bit after seeing uh, his talks in the film. I didn't have enough time to talk to him. Uh, there was a big, we called it uh, downtown. The women and the Polish big expedition, so there was big uh, life in that base camp, three of us only. So, uh, that was that, but uh, looking back uh, in those days, uh, I knew uh, Tadaush, uh, who unfortunately fell down K2. Uh, he was on Rakaposhi. He climbed uh, Rakaposhi with Sher Khan and some other Polish uh, members of the team. Uh, he was extremely strong, but once you lose a crampon, it becomes extremely tricky at that altitude and I think it happened just around the bottleneck which I call death throat, uh, one of the most tricky spots up the Abruzzi Ridge where maximum accidents took place, maximum people died uh, around this uh, almost 100 meters uh, around that altitude. A film is just uh, <clears throat> I took away my breath for a while uh, seeing some of those scenes uh, because I, I knew many of many of the climbers who are uh, in the inter uh, interviews, Reinhold and everything. Uh, brilliant film. I congratulate you and your team for this amazing success. Thank you. Uh, by the way, uh, for those of you, I, I, I didn't introduce Nazi Sabar. He is one of the best climbers of Pakistan. He's, he's the first Pakistani to climb Everest. The <laughs> second Pakistani to climb K2, and he's climbed a lot of 8,000 meter peaks. And by the way, this trip, maybe the broad peak trip that you're talking about, at that time, Colonel Sher Khan, Reinhold Messner, and him, they made a world record of climbing two peaks in one go. So they went up G2, came down, and then climbed broad peak. Is that it true? The fastest yeah. Of yeah. Two the fastest. Ascent of two peaks at that time. It was a world record. So, but maybe uh, anybody has a question. It's going to be easier for me. That's the first question. Something confusing. I think I'm audible, right? <laughs> yeah, you are. So, what do you th first? Excellent. It's just breathtaking. What do you think is a difficult mountain to climb, your own personal ego or Everest? Because what we see in the movie, somebody who can climb Everest, K2, Nanga Parbat, what do you think personally is a difficult mountain to climb? What's the most difficult? Yeah. I think K2. K2. Or personal ego. <laughs> uh, no, I'm asking, you know, this competition, media, all that, uh, what do you think personally, like, as, as a, ah. yeah, well, what, what is a difficult mountain to climb, your own personal ego yeah. or Everest? You know, I think, uh, oh, it's, 
Uh, it's a, a question for a million dollar. It's hard to say. It's I don't know. I'm not a climber myself. I was trying to climb when I was in uh, uh, high school, but it's not for me. I just failed the the, uh, the the school of climbing, which was for like for for two weeks. Everybody can pass that school, but not me. It's not for me. Filmmaking is for me. So uh, uh, I made a film because I can't climb uh, literally. I can walk, uh, but not climbing. Um, the the Kukuchka uh, was the hero of my childhood. I'm, I was born in 1980 during the communist time. It was pretty poor times in Poland. Only two channels in Polish TV, no private TV of girls. So as a, as a child, as a kid, I was a witness of Kukuczka. He was kind of a superhero for me. In my child imagination, I couldn't imagine that something bad could happen to him. But in uh, October 24th, 1989, something bad, really bad happened to him. He sacrificed uh, everything, his life, for his passion. It's uh, hard to say. Uh, I, I think Wielicki and Kukuczka are saying in the film, of course, we are egoists, but it's good. Is it good for them? Maybe. For their families? You know, I, I met uh, many wives of, of uh, climbers who died, and they, we spent a lot of hours of talking, honest uh, conversation, and all of them, Celina, uh, Danka Piotrowska, uh, Wanda Chok, all of them told me that they would not change their lives. Those husbands who died, they were the loss of their life. And I think that's the most Im Im important statement. Their words, not mine, the, the guy from the, you know, from the lowlands, but their wives who, who that they are still alone. They didn't find anybody who can replace Kukuczka or Piotrowski or Chalk or, or many others. Uh, so yeah, I think it's an interesting subject to make a film about the, about the wives. They are also uh, heroes. They were raising uh, kids and take care of everything when the when the husbands were in in the mountains they were eight nine miles outside home it's, it's a lot uh, yeah uh, about the race I, yeah. may I just uh, like you said it's a million dollar question very difficult one and I think most climbers try to uh, sneak away from this question. It's a very tricky one, Kansa uh, has asked. I think uh, ego comes much later uh, to a climber, but I think it is much more than that. The very uh, spirit of cur curiosity and uh, spirit of adventure that all human beings, men and women, we all possess that, uh, to, to discover something unknown, and uh, mountains have that spiritual power that attracts a lot of people. Uh, it, mountains have always something to give back to you uh, in terms of spiritual happiness. But once you start involving yourself that close, then mountains have that uh, power to hold on the strings. I have uh, lost my elder brother and about 54 closest friends on mountains, all of them. And uh, why I go back, quite often I get this question. I think uh, there is a time when then it becomes, mountaineering becomes an addiction because any sport and mountaineering being one of the most uh, risky and dangerous sports, I think mountaineering is one sport where you are addicted, quite addicted to it, uh, despite the fact that you curse yourself on the mountains, you are not enjoying all the time. Of course, uh, quite a lot of suffering, but there is a deep pleasure despite going through all these tragedies and everything, and I call it addiction of a kind which mountains then uh, pull the strings uh, quite often and then you go back to the mountains. And uh, yeah, when you are 
up on top like people like Reinhold and Kukushka and all those Himalayan stars, probably uh, if you leave your family back and I think ego becomes little part of the whole thing. It's not just ego, but I think it is the romance of the most beautiful things on this universe that mountains are quite spiritual things than anything around uh, our universe. I think uh, there is more to uh, ego. Yeah. <laughs> I think that the, the romance of mountains and the spiritual feeling but that you have, every step is like a tasbih, we call it. As you go closer uh, and quite across the boundaries of life and death situations. So when you play with that situation, it becomes quite addicting. And I think uh, I would just uh, edit there. I hope I'm able yeah. to answer. <laughs> it's a very difficult Nazisa, question. There was a very famous climber, the British climber Mallory. You know, they think he was the first one to perhaps climb Everest. Nobody will ever know, but somebody yeah. asked him, why do you climb mountains? And he said, just because they're there. Yeah. <coughs> And there's another very famous climber called Gulzaman Charsi, you know. So I asked him, why do you climb mountains? And he said, I climb mountains not to win, but to lose, to lose my fears. So some people cl climb mountains to lose their fears. Some climb, people climb mountains to polish their ego. It's a very subjective thing. So my question is from Mr. Nazir Sabir also. Uh, if you saw, uh, you saw the film, obviously, and you see how they used to become smugglers to finance their expeditions. So, did you do something like that too? Were you also a smuggler? <laughs> and secondly, my question, and maybe Ambassador Pisarski can uh, answer that because he was a, he's a bit of a historian. What was the situation in the 80s where people had to queue for food? That's not something we've seen in Europe, obviously. It's not a Europe we've seen. So, um, if you could first answer it, then... I'll try to be brief. <laughs> yes, uh, I remember... Uh, uh, I started climbing around those days and uh, although I have climbed most of my times, most of the time with uh, Japanese friends, but I have more friends in Poland than anywhere else. I think uh, I have the pleasure of meeting some of the finest mountaineers, uh, uh, Himalayan mountaineers. And I do remember they used to bring huge trucks full of sleeping bags and tents and stuff. You know, we didn't even have anything uh, in those days in Pakistan and Nepal, nearly nothing. And uh, they realized that they were clever enough, they would bring stuff and trick around those uh, tricky rules in, in the country here and also in Nepal, like they said uh, in the film. They sold things uh, very cheap. I still remember one sleeping bag would cost around 800 rupees. Uh, Rupee was better still <laughs> in the 80s and uh, a tent would cost about 2,000 rupees, yeah, 2,500 rupees, like yeah. Yes, and shoes and stuff. So they would bring big trucks full of uh, loads of trucks and would sell uh, stuff here and then that's how they would uh, finance their expeditions. And I also remember the political situation of Poland then. They used to curse most of the climbers as they are. They were free souls, you know. They would uh, they were cursing the political situation back home. Uh, uh, martial law and the the anti-Russian movement was going on. Those were the freedom times, and I remember they were extremely happy uh, when they came back after the independent of a kind. <laughs> <laughs> This was a brilliant film. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, should I uh, 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 add something to, uh, as a kind of historical background? Um, very quickly, uh, in the seventh, in the early 70s, uh, Poland, uh, ruled by the Communist Party, then experienced a very rapid uh, industrialization and, and economic growth. But it was uh, mostly due to taking in lots of foreign um, loans. So those loans uh, started uh, needed to be repaid, uh, starting from the uh, end of the 70s, uh, and w basically um, uh, put the country in a very difficult economic situation, which resulted in a permanent and chronic shortages of everything. 
So um, in uh, beginning of the uh, of the end of 70s, uh, the, com uh, the government started to ration food, starting with sugar, but also from you know meat and other stuff. And so and then situation even deteriorated after the imposition of the martial law, because. Um, uh, the main uh, creditors of then Poland, uh, like United States, uh, France, uh, Germany, they imposed sanctions on the communist government. So basically, that led to the complete uh, breakdown of, of of the economic situation in Poland, and uh, later on, uh, Poland declared bankruptcy. So we, we went through very very tough time. But at the you know, but it was also a kind of. Um, uh, bottom line from which we could uh, basically start um, reforming the economy and, and, and that led to the to, to the change of the government change of the system and i think that uh, also the memories of of this very dire situation this is a generation of my generation and my parents generation led to this very strong resilience and uh, and, and and power behind uh, this uh, recent polish economic miracle thank you uh, if I might make a comment, it's a, a brilliant film and I learned a lot about mountaineering from it and it both um, enlightens and frightens because uh, you see that people are risking their lives and then you see them actually sliding down mountains to their death and you ask, for what? Those mountains were there before, they'll be there after. But there's, as Nazir said, this is some inner impulse which is driving people, some kind of an addiction. And I sort of respect that because you have to push the frontiers all the time. But now my question to Nazir and to Vajad both is, um, why is it that the Polish people that the Poles who uh, had all this problem with, uh, with, with simple things like food and they were in a very difficult political situation with the Soviets. They still went ahead and lots of them climbed mountains but um, here in Pakistan uh, we don't seem to be very energetic about pushing frontiers. We say, yes, the mountains are there, let them be there. Only a few people like you, Nazir, are actually climbing. Why so few of us, so many of them? Uh, I would be extremely uh, thankful for my situation, for being born in Pakistan. If I was on somewhere else, probably I will never get this far. Uh, my humble, uh, whatever little I was able to do was uh, due to the fact that I came across some friends uh, from Japan. Uh, they are my mentors and uh, then thanks to the Pakistan Army who uh, sent an expedition out to Payu Peak where I was one of the two civilians who were taken on this expedition and we were trained by an American instructor. The army uh, invited an instructor in 1976. So those, that's where we started. Uh, the Pakistani climbing activity starts with Payu, which was unclimbed. We were able to climb this one of the most beautiful mountains. I call it Chokidar, the caretaker of Baltoro, because it sits <laughs> at the front door. It just opens the Baltoro. Uh, then you have the K2 and all the big mountains beyond. Payu comes first. Uh, Payu is a very uh, unique mountain, small. Americans and French failed. And the first Pakistani victim of mountaineering, Momin Hamid, unfortunately, fell to his death on uh, Payu Peak uh, from War Kent. Uh, Momin Hamid died in 76, uh, 74. And then we went in, in 76 and climbed. I was lucky to be the first person to reach the summit and I think that was the biggest kick in my climbing career. Now coming back to your question, sir. Uh, I am a great uh, fan of yours, uh, admirer of what you are doing in this country. You are a great voice. Uh, <clears throat> just to... <laughs> 
Sorry, I'm, I missed out on mentioning uh, Kep, my dear uh, uh, Captain Amjad uh, was member of the Payo expedition and he, was, he went very high. Uh, unfortunately, we did not have a second summit team and, uh, for, because of weather and uh, they didn't get to the summit. But uh, yes, it's a long story, sir. Payu, uh, three Pakistanis, we went uh, after a summit, uh, bivouac, snow cave, and, and the last night we spent in a snow cave, and then uh, next day we made it to the summit, and that was the first Pakistani mountaineering humble success with the help of the American, of course. He did most of the hardest pitches, and I was the youngest and craziest, so he gave me opportunity to lead some of the easier ones, so that's where I... I think I was lucky to be able to learn uh, on the job uh, training. Uh, going back to what Pakistan uh, is doing, having the largest, uh, I think the greatest wealth anywhere outside the polar regions, we have the largest number of glaciers and the biggest, I think four times bigger than the Nepal Himalaya our mountains, starting from Afghanistan to end of Siachen, China border, and then just above the Margala foothills, the Himalayan starts. This whole thing is bigger than half of Nepal. Our mountains are huge. Uh, we have a great wealth of mountains. But unfortunately, uh, you know, even the British, <laughs> If there are some British here, I, with, forgive me for saying this, but they just came for a horse riding to Murray Hills and stuff. They did the first mountaineering, uh, they started the first mountaineering institute in India. They left all this in India and nothing here. Uh, the other day I was also talking at the uh, Marriott, uh, they arranged a uh, mountaineering evening. You know, even today almost a dozen countries are training mountaineers in Nepal and not a single one till today coming to Pakistan. At the same time, we ourselves, including myself, uh, you know, I was running the Alpine Club for six uh, long years. There is more politics like everywhere else in the Alpine Club and uh, Adventure Foundation. They have been in the front of uh, but they didn't unfortunately achieve, they could not get there. As a nation, uh, the, I blame the politicians or whoever are there ruling this country for uh, 57 years, uh, sorry, 75 years, uh, they did not realize the treasure in terms of mountain wealth we have. Dr. Sahab? I think it is a tragedy. They never realized it. Unfortunately, we don't know. I have traveled, been lucky to travel to around 50 plus countries, but simply there is no comparison to Pakistan. You have the virgin beaches, amazing history of mankind here, and then you have the mountain wealth. Uh, by why no tourists and why no mountaineers from this country? simply because we do not even have a, s a small mountaineering institute even today. Yeah. We have a facility for the army training, you know, because of Siachen, but not nothing for civilians, not even a single. There is great uh, potential and interest in last uh, two decades, especially in Pakistan, there's great youth interest, girls and boys both want to go trekking and climbing, but to address that, there is not no institution in this country. So, but if you look at how mountaineering started, like cricket, it is the, the <laughs> British who started mountaineering yeah, in 1890s. Uh, they used to climb in the Alps and the Swiss used to be their porters. The Swiss locals acted as porters like our people in the north 
uh, you know, carrying loads and stuff. The British started this mountaineering. And then they went all over the Himalaya, and especially Karakurum, chasing the passes, you know, chasing the Russians out of the area, uh, spying mostly. They uh, did all the exploration. And then the nations sent in their own expeditions, like the Germans, Hitler, uh, after they climbed the north face of Eiger, this is the masterpiece, a test piece for Himalayan climbing in Europe. Uh, they climbed, Germans climbed the Eiger after many fatalities. Then he sent them to Nanga Parvat. And there's a great story, you know, while they were climbing, the world's, uh, Second World War started and uh, the Germans, some of them sneaked into Tibet. Seven Years in Tibet is the very famous mm -hmm. book uh, written by Heinrich Harrer, an Austrian, yeah, and the film made uh, by about this. He became then teacher for the Dalai Lama. So the Nanga Parvat expedition, while they were climbing the war, Second World War started and they just escaped into Tibet and some of them were arrested actually. And then the nation sent and then the university clubs and you know, so there is no tradition. Even in India, uh, in India of course they have, there are more climbers because as I told you the British left uh, uh, two institutes and then later on they, they are now having six mountaineering training institutes in India, in Nepal, in Iran <laughs> where they don't, ha they have only Damawand. In Iran they have a mountaineering institute. So this is one of the reasons I think uh, answering uh, your question we have these mountains but you. unfortunately no. <laughs> I would like to. <laughs> you thank you Jesus, sir. Really? He actually answered my question. The British started climbing in, in Europe and then they left us with cricket. <laughs> so, and Imran, Khan. and Imran Khan. Yeah, there you go. So we were not left with climbing, but... Uh, How about Poland? Yes. Yeah, Poland. Yeah, that... <coughs> in Poland, they started to climb. They, they couldn't uh, leave the communistic Poland uh, uh, till the till 60s and then as they could leave, they leave. They they they, they left uh, in two hundred percent. They start to to climb like like madness. Uh, it's a kind of a joke why the climbers from Silesia, the region in South Poland, uh, are so good because they the the attitude and the air is so polluted in in mm. Silesia that they they don't care about the attitude in, in high mountains, but Kukuczka was from that region, Wielicki, um, Richard Pawłowski, Artur Heiser, Janusz Mayer, Richard Warecki, big hello to Nazir from Rysiek. And uh, not only uh, Silesia region, also the first um, woman who climbed K2 and Mount Everest, Wanda, Wanda Rutkiewicz. Mm. Uh, she was a pole from Wrocław, from actually my city, my region. Um, I, don't, I think it's a combination of, uh, of many things. The Polish fantasy, the Polish hunger of being closed for so many years, and finally in the late 60s we could, we could move and they organized first um, expedition to, uh, to Hindukush, I believe, for, on one of the 6,000 meters uh, 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 peaks. Saragara. Yeah, Saragara. that was the one. And then the 70s and 80s uh, came, and then there were the best years in the history of Polish uh, high altitude uh, climbing. But not only, I think, in, 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 in climbing, uh, Reinhold Messner is an uh, interesting example. He himself, he respects Jerzy Kukuczka deeply. He's got uh, two monuments in his uh, one of uh, three uh, castle museum. Uh, I, was, I, I visited him in Bolzano, North Italy. And he's got two monuments of Herodot, a famous ancient uh, a traveler, also a, a, a histo of course historian, and, and Jerzy Kukuczka. Uh, uh, Messner had a well, huge ego, 
So he's pretty mad and he's not happy with the opinion that he was uh, in anything um, not better than Kukuczka. But in my film, this opinion is in the, in the um, uh, uh, lips of Carlos Carsolio, uh, Nepalese Sherpas. Not only Poles are saying Kukuczka was better. People uh, all over the world, yeah. like, like um, Nazir. So I, I think uh, Messner told, told me privately that uh, he was better in the 70s, but Kukuczka defi definitely was better in the 80s. I think that's a good, good mm. compromise. So, yeah, but, but Poles, even today, they are pr pretty, pretty good. The climbing uh, changed a lot, like Wielicki is saying. Now there is not, not too many patriotic acts. And nobody is keeping the flag on the, on the top of the mountain. Uh, cell phones, making pictures, publicity is very important, also the money. But still, uh, there are many young people in many organizations. Every single bigger city in Poland has his Alpine, Alpine Club, uh, Klub Wysokogórski, we, we call them, in Wrocław, Katowice, of course, Warszawa, Kraków, Szczecin, all over the, the country, there are those clubs. What uh, Mr. Paczkowski, the head of the main Alpine Club for whole country, told me that it's not good to, to make the commercial about the climbing, because it could end it very bad, like, like for um, Mr. Brother and, and hundreds of of, of uh, your friends and people from the film. So if somebody will come to a school of climbing because uh, uh, he heard somewhere that it's a good um, thing to do, it's okay, but we should not make the commercials about the climbing. That's, yeah, yeah. That, that's interesting point of view. But yeah, I'm, I'm pretty, that's why I made this film, because Kuczka was one of the, uh, my heroes, um, the for sure the, the biggest one, the most important one. But he's not the, the only one. Even today, young people are very good climbers. There are many mountain film festivals in Poland. Uh, we met on yeah. one of them in, in South Korea, the, the huge festival. But in Poland, like, like I think, 12 or 13 uh, festivals like this. So, yeah. Perfect. You, you justified with the, uh, the great personality the uh, the one who made uh, amazing history in mountaineering your documentary is uh, justifying uh, <clears throat> the character and again uh, just giving you a bit more about pakistani climbing in recent years uh, unfortunately in last uh, two decades commercial climbing uh, took over in nepal a bit earlier but in pakistan uh, commercial climbing uh, you know, like you charge somebody uh, who has a little bit of uh, experience, they come, uh, especially Nepalese companies are operating in Pakistan, they bring commercial expeditions, you have money, you pay about $60,000, and they come and climb K2 or Broad Peak. They, this style of climbing, which we call commercial climbing, has taken away the real spirit of climbing because the Sherpas are good because they were born at a very high altitude by uh, because of this they are very good uh, they perform better on higher altitude there than anyone else they come they are acclimatized they fix ropes camps just you carry your lunch box and your camera and uh, you, you know they sometimes the even <laughs> use oxygen yeah. pretty low uh, I climbed K2 without oxygen, I climbed uh, Everest with oxygen, but all other <coughs> mountains uh, without oxygen. But this co commercial climbing has taken away the real spirit of mountaineering. That's why I called the golden age of uh, Himalayan it's climbing. Gone. <laughs> uh, and somewhere uh, early 90s or mid 90s in Pakistan. But we have a lot of climbers now, uh, some in a big, but still few in comparison, like you said, sir. Uh, we have quite a lot of them, uh, you know, Naila, Kiani, Sirbaz and Khan. Kashib, Sarbaz, and many others. Uh, almost a dozen climbers who are quite active in recent years. Uh, so this is a new change. And they get sponsors also. I didn't even get a match box <laughs> when, <laughs> when I was climbing. I, di I was not even good at it. We didn't even seek 
but now I think uh, there are more companies in Pakistan who sponsor. So there's a quite a, bi a bit of activity, but it is a very dangerous sport. But unfortunately, we do not have proper training facilities. This is the biggest challenge. Uh, this is Munir Ahmed. Yeah. Uh, Nazir Sawir Sahib. Uh, you have uh, answered my uh, second uh, question. Uh, first of all, um, I must uh, uh, congratulate you. It's a wonderful uh, presentation uh, of a hero. And you really uh, did justice uh, with your hero. And this is very unfortunate that uh, we could not uh, uh, glamorize our magnificent mountains and uh, uh, our wonderful mountaineers. Uh, Nazir Sabir Sab, do we have really such kind of uh, uh, films on our uh, mountain heroes? Like, uh, we are a bit uh, quite far behind in mountaineering. Uh, uh, Professor Sir was asking uh, the reasons why we are not active. I think just like that, uh, we are far behind. We made a documentary on Paiu in 76. Uh, I was carrying the camera all the way to the summit, eight kilograms, Russian camera. <laughs> <laughs> the army had eight kilograms camera, but unfortunately, it did not work on the summit. <laughs> so, <laughs> we, uh, we have a documentary, but uh, yeah, nothing like this, you know, we are still far behind. Uh, the climbing activities mostly undertaken by the army expeditions. They used to send army expeditions out uh, for many years. In recent years, they are uh, quite slow. But most of the climbing activity took place in Pakistan uh, that was organized by the army, army expeditions. For their own reasons, they had finances and stuff. But the civilian side has been slow. But going back to this question, uh, no such documentary. I think it will take many years. Wajahat uh, may put some light on this. This is his subject. Yeah. Um I would love to make a film on Nazir Sabir and Ashraf Aman and Colonel Sher Khan because you know they are the two heroes of this country who actually pushed the envelope. But uh, it's all about finances and it's all about uh, you know taking the lead as a filmmaker and adventure, adventure travel filmmaker. I would love to make a film, but uh, you know every time I go knocking on a door, you know I get a pat on my back and they say thank you very much. I'd like to say this is an amazing film that you made. This is the second time I'm watching this film. And uh, where, where did you see the film for the first time? I saw it at the film festival. Ah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I think it's going to go down in history as one of the best, you know, historical films about Polish mountaineering, along with the, uh, I think it was Marek uh, Klosowicz's film. Marek Klosowicz. Yes. Yeah, good the Art of, of Freedom. Mine, yeah. Excellent, excellent film about Polish mountaineering. So I mean, I'd like to say fantastic effort and uh, also to uh, you know the filmmakers in this country i think i don't i don't, I don't really think you've made a vi really a big budget movie but there was a will and there was a passion and also i mean he was your hero so you made this movie right and that is i think what we need m more of in uh, in our in our country to portray our heroes we need more passion and more uh, drive to uh, tell those stories uh, I, uh excuse me uh, i'd also like to ask you if you're going to um, Make, or if you have thought about making a movie of uh, about Wanda Rutkiewicz, you mentioned that she was from your uh, like you know hometown, and I think she's also she was the first person to climb K2, and uh, she climbed I think 10 or 11, yeah. 8,000 meter mountains. She was one of the most famous climbers of her time, and I think her deserve uh, her story also deserves to be told. Uh, Wanda is a wonderful subject, but uh, her uh, uh, strong message uh, was I'm a woman. Uh, I'm uh, climbing uh, as a woman. Uh, the first ascent of K2 was a woman ascent, uh, uh, and the same with Everest and many other um, uh, uh, peaks. So I even had a proposition to make a film uh, about uh, Wanda Rutkiewicz, as I, I told to Mr. Ambassador even to today. But in my opinion, I said no, because in my opinion, women should make uh, a film about Wanda. And right now, 
uh, that big fiction film is m uh, m making about uh, Wanda and men is doing the film. <laughs> <laughs> of course, uh, Maciek Kipschitz, a good friend of mine, uh, ex-professor from the film school. Uh, uh, she's she's wonderful character. The end, what happened with her at the end? She was climbing Kanjonga in 1992, and she disappeared. Carlos Carsolio, the Mexican climber, was the the last person who saw so, her uh, going from Kanjonga, and she was trying to reach the top. And her mother, that's amazing. She, she was the the beloved uh, daughter of of her mother, and till the very end of her uh, life, the mother of Wanda Rutkiewicz believed that she's alive. Mm. She went to Kanjonga, go to another side of the mountain, and she's living in monastery with monks. And yeah, there was a huge problem because everybody knew she's she, she dead. She's dead, but because of the love and the imagination of her mother, she believed that Wanda is alive. And some some days she will call her or even come to 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 visit her in Poland. So that's really sad. Yeah, that's like sad and interesting. In the other, uh, it's some so, somehow the story about the love. But yeah, in my opinion, that's the story for a woman. You know, for a woman perspective. Um, uh, I'm I'm not a mountain person, and the uh, the Kukuczka was the only uh, character for me to make a film about him. I was thinking about the. The Krzysztof Wilicki, because he's alive, uh, which is not that common in that uh, that um, world of climbers, but but still no, I I'm 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 I after Jurek I made three other films completely different, uh, the film in India I shoot the film in uh, about Ludwig Hirschfeld now I'm preparing fiction film about older people. And that's what's really enjoyable for, for me, that the, the ho whole film, every each of the next film is a completely different world that I, I can touch. But for sure, I'm really happy that this film has a nine years old and it's still alive. It's got a distribution in cinemas all, all over the Italy, November, December and January. So usually it's not common, uh, it's a documentary. Yeah, and it's true, we didn't have a huge budget. We made this film in a style how they climb in the 80s, you know? Yes. A lot of asking, <laughs> a lot of <laughs> sneaking, a lot of... We couldn't afford to buy uh, a license for a footage from the um, uh, TVs from West, uh, from Germany, for example, very uh, expensive. So we shoot our own footage, you know, with actors who really take a lot, a, 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 um, a little, only a little money, sim sim symbolic money, uh, girls with costumes also um, uh, work because of passion, because of a love for a subject and for a money. And we stage a lot of archives, which is a fun because our viewers, even uh, I remember Krzysztof Wielicki after the premiere screening of the film told me, you know, how did you get all those uh, archives from Wojtek Kurtyka? We are exchanging our archives, our footage, but he didn't give me the one that you have in the film. I said, Krzysztof, we staged that. <laughs> we shoot that in Tatra mountains, which are very similar to Karakorum and Himalaya, the same age. And we, we shoot that, and after a few months, we met on another screening, and he said, yes, of course, I, I, can, <laughs> I can tell that, that it's, <laughs> it's not uh, the real uh, Himalayas and Karakorum. Yes, uh, Messner, I, about the money, Messner was the only uh, interviewer, the only person who wrote me back, actually his assistant, and they said, of, of course, we can t talk with your crew uh, for money, a lot of money. Yeah. Yes. We couldn't afford for that kind of money, so we said like w one ten of this money, and the assistant responds, of course, but it's not going to be three hour conversation, but like 15 minutes. But when we arrived, when he noticed that the, the driver is a sound uh, operator and my camera operator is really hardworking and we threw all the way from Poland to, to Tyrol to North uh, it, uh, Italy and, and immediately we are, we are making an interview because we couldn't afford for a hotel or, or things like this. So we, we spent like two hours together, even more. Then we have a private tour around his castle, so I was pretty sure that I don't have pay anything because we are almost friends. And at the end I said, Mr. Messner, I heard that, that there is something, a fee for this interview. And he said, yeah, second floor, my roof assistant, you can pay there. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I, and I went and I paid cash, of course. So yeah, uh, somebody told me that's why he's a millionaire. 
he's expensive, very, very expensive, but, but that's why he's a millionaire and he's got a free castles and climbers from the gold age of climbing sometimes are... Because yeah. when I was uh, in, in, in South Korea, after I met him, because you know, they, they were my references, and I said, look, I, I have a mountain film festival and I would like to invite him over. And he said, yeah, you must talk to my manager because we charge a lot of money. We, we, we knew what was the amount of, of uh, how they, they bring him to Korea. He's a star, but, but still, uh, his achievements in mountains in the 70s, he was a kind of pioneer, and what he also um, experienced, the death of his beloved brother, Ginter. He's, um, uh, for me, he was nice, he was nice. From the 15 minutes, we, we uh, talked more than two hours, he was honest, this uh, uh, sentence when he's saying, that's his bullshit, <laughs> yeah, that's really uh, truthful. Uh, and he really deeply respects Kukuchka. Uh, Nazir Sahib, aapke liye question. So, um, your ascent of A2, uh, K2, sorry, uh, 1981, first ascent of the West Face, there was an, with Aiho Tani, it was an excellent, uh, you know, uh, excellently captured documentary on this made by the Japanese. Uh, but it's just disappeared. I've been looking for that documentary for maybe 20 years now, but I think if you approach the Japanese, you could get them from their archives or something. I think the university that like, you know, sponsored the expedition, they, they must have footage. And I think we need to get hold of that film because it's a record of your amazing uh, climb with Otani and which was of course the first uh, ascent of the West Face. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, I failed. <laughs> uh, we were lucky. Uh, I was part of the 77 Japanese Pakistan expedition and went very high. We came back from below the uh, bottleneck. Uh, the first team, f uh, four craziest, youngest Japanese and myself were put on the first team. We failed because of bad weather. And next day, three uh, Japanese climbed, followed by Ashraf and another three we put seven people on the summit in 77. While coming down, uh, my team, which were not lucky, we hugged, cried, because the leader, we wanted to go up, but the leader said, forget it, we have put seven people on the summit, so we are going home. We were coming down, crying, we hugged each other on the uh, shoulder, promised to come and climb K2 together. But unfortunately, all four of them died on different mountains. Watanabe was crushed by a snow machine in Japan. So I was the only one carrying this promise from 77 on my shoulders till I got this opportunity to go and climb K2 with another team uh, organized by the Waseda. Waseda is like Oxford in Japan. Waseda uh, Alpine Club expedition. and. Uh, in the end, to cut it short, we spent 70 days on K2. And uh, in the end, three of us went for the summit team. We were selected, uh, three of us, and uh, we spent a night only uh, at about less than 100 meters below the summit. We did not reach the summit that day. We had no choice. We could not come down or go up, obviously. It got dark, so we dug a snow hole and spent the whole night. Next morning then we got our guts together, went up, Yamashita was tired and he gave up uh, literally uh, 50 meters below the summit, altitude wide, wise, but otherwise about 150 meters walking distance from the main summit. Uh, Otani and I, uh, the leader was calling us back. He said, bad luck, you could not make it. If you spend another night out, then you will not make it back. So come back. I had a big uh, discussion. This is the climax of the entire film. I cannot repeat the words here. I was pretty uh, angry at the leader at base camp who was calling us back. I said, I then, uh, you know, uh, acted like a Pakistani. I said, here I am the leader of myself. I don't care about any leader. I'm going myself. So I threw the transceiver away to Otani. I said, if you want to come, come. Otherwise, I'm going alone without rope. 
I went 10 steps and he said, please stop. And then we both uh, tied onto the rope. Yamashita was the one who got the permission from the leader. He begged him, he said, I am not well, I will sit here. Please allow both of them. Only then he said, okay, go ahead. But Nazir, how long do you think it will take from here to the summit? I said, about one hour. Okay, promise with me that after one hour, even if you are 10 meters below the summit, you will return. I said, forget about it. I don't care about you. I am my own leader. So, you know, this was the point. <laughs> so we went and then uh, 20 meters below the summit, I stopped. I was uh, leading because it's quite easy. West summit to the man's summit, you go into the Chinese side, pretty easy ridge, snow ridge. I stopped and then told Utani to take the uh, this you know glory of the summit because I was a guest climber on their expedition. He said, Nazir, no, no, keep going. Probably he didn't understand what I meant. I then grabbed his uh, uh, arm and then we did the final 20 meters hand in hand uh, to the summit. Yes, uh, they made a wonderful film. The, uh, the cameraman had not even climbed even 5,000 meter peak, he came all the way and went up to 7,000 meters making the documentary. The name of the documentary is 50, uh, 50 Days. Yes, 50 Days uh, Struggle. But unfortunately, I was, give, uh, I was sent a copy, but it was not good quality. Then somebody took it away. Ziaul Haq, when he visited Japan, he was gifted a copy. I saw it on television a couple of times. <laughs> then I didn't even have a clue, you know, to get even a copy. I went to the uh, television and here and there in Japan. Uh, Asahi TV was the one who were hosting, uh, but I didn't get a copy. Uh, they said we only made a uh, copy in English version for Ziaul Haq. We don't have it, but they don't. I tried my best. I even met the director in Japan. I just couldn't manage it, unfortunately. Yes, it's one of the best documentaries of uh, on, on K2, but sadly I don't have it. Really getting, no, 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 that's fine. It's really getting, getting late. I just wanna thank uh, Black Hall Community Center for hosting this event, mm, uh, very kind of you, and then we are very happy and fortunate to be able to work with you. And of course, I would like to thank our uh, uh, guest of honor, Mr. Nazir Sabir, I mean, for sharing, you know, first-hand experience, his experience with uh, with Polish climbers and then uh, beautifully um, kind of uh, um, replicated in words the, the, the spirit that has motivated them, had motivated them and still continues to do this. And I'm, of course, grateful to, to our friend from Poland to a wonderful uh, uh, Paweł uh, Wysoczyński uh, for uh, making this movie and also for bringing uh, it uh, to Pakistan again, as I, as, as I heard. But I think with this additional conversation, I think we have gained much deeper, much richer perspective, uh, not only about Jerzyt Kukuczka, but also about Poland, Pakistan, the love of mountains, the love of freedom. Thank you very much. Thank you.